We're looking at Luke's description of Christ's values in the Gospel of Luke. And these values uh, show us how that when it comes to living like Jesus, we're in big trouble. You know what? You and I cannot live at this standard. And I don't care how disciplined you are, you're going to fall short of Christ's standard. And we'll look at three of those standards this morning. Uh, standards where you and I uh, feel like, well, that's the American way. Well, it may be the American way, but is it the biblical way? You know, the difficulty with life is that it's so daily. <laughs> daily we have to deal with uh, our possessions. Daily we have to deal with our employment responsibilities. Daily we have to deal with our family relations. And when life is so daily that we neglect God, there is where we have let the moment overwhelm eternity. So here this morning, we're going to find out why that many of our excuses are false excuses. Stories told of a missionary in Africa, and he came to this fork in the road. And sitting right at the fork was a witch doctor, a shaman. They, went by, they go by different names. And he has a stick, and he flips it up in the air, and it lands on the ground. And the missionary watches him do this about 20, 30 times, flip up the stick in the air, comes down to the ground. So the missionary says, uh, what are you doing with that stick? And he says, well, this is a magic stick. And I need to know here at the fork in the road, should I go to the right or should I go to the left? And he said, well, I understand that, but why are you flipping it up so many times? And he goes, it's still not telling me the way I want to go. <laughs> you and I are much like that when it comes to God's will. Sometimes we keep seeking God's will because the will that we know is his will is not the will that we want to do. So here we're going to look this morning at Luke chapter 14. And the backstory here is in Luke 14 verses 12 to 14. It's not in your outline. I apologize for that. But uh, Jesus went on to say to the one who had invited him, Jesus has been invited to a prestigious dinner. And uh, when you, he says to the ones who invited him to the dinner, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends and your brothers and your relatives and your rich neighbors, lest they invite you in return and repay uh, you for coming. Okay? So, uh, when, you, when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you'll be repaid on the day of the resurrection of the righteous. So Christ has been invited to this dinner. It's all the local big shots. And Jesus says, when, when you host a party, don't invite just your family and friends who will just give back to you. How about inviting some people who need dinner? And I was thinking about this passage in terms of my own hospitality, and I fall into this very same trap. Basically, when Gwen and I host a dinner, it's our relatives who can give back. So I don't do very well on this one. But Paul here, excuse me, Jesus here is confronting basically the Pharisaical Jewish community. How would we describe the Pharisaical Jewish community? Very nice religious people. You know what I see this morning? I see a group of very nice religious people. In other words, this room is not filled with drug addicts and prostitutes and gamblers and drunkards. This room is filled with very nice religious people, which means this parable has a lot to say to us this morning. Because you see, God is extending an invitation to you, and the you here this morning are the very nice people. What does it say here in your text in Luke 14, verses 15 through 17? Now, when one of those who were reclining at table with Jesus heard this, he said to Jesus, 
Blessed is everyone who shall eat bread in the kingdom. You see, the tension was so strong there that one of the guests felt like, well, I think uh, Jesus is putting us down when we're all very nice religious people, so I'll just remind us all that we're all going to heaven. Wouldn't you like me to remind you this morning that we're all going to heaven and we're going to have a party? As a matter of fact, the word here for big party, the word big is the word mega. We're going to have a mega party together in heaven someday. And it'll be a feast. It'll be filled with joy and abundance. I mean, don't you want to hear that good news? That's good news, isn't it? Well, it doesn't look like it's that good of news here when Christ is talking. Because Christ says, uh, Christ says to the man who blurted out, Blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom. Christ said to him, A certain man is giving a big dinner, a mega dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to those who had been invited, Come for everything is now ready. The kingdom feast, the kingdom party, is one of the clear themes of the Old Testament. For example, in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6, it says, On this eternal mountain, this is the new Jerusalem, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, and the best of meats. I mean, we're talking, just imagine, God has to be the best host who uh, can be imaginable, and he's going to prepare a feast for us in the eternal kingdom, and that feast will keep on going for probably years, would be my, my guess. But interestingly enough, as he in, invites these uh, people, the, the rich man who's holding the big feast, he starts to get Excuses. Excuses. I hear a lot of excuses today. Uh, one excuse I often hear is, I'm waiting for more inspiration from the pastor's sermon. <laughs> or I need a perfect spiritual mentor or example before I start to serve. Or I need more experience or more training before I start to serve. Or the things that I do not approve of at church must go away before I will serve. Or I need uh, instructions from the audible voice of God. Dennis, get your act together. Okay, I want a supernatural Damascus Road type experience that will light my fire so I can go do Jesus' will. Or this is a big one. I'm waiting for God to declare this life just a dress rehearsal where some script changes are permitted in the next life when it really counts. Folks, this is it. This is not a dress rehearsal. The, the reality of eternity is based upon the reality of right now. And we need to think in those terms. So Christ here begins to show how selfish the excuses are. Almost anything can wait. But to do God's business can't wait. And I believe there are those of you here this morning and those of you watching online that need to do business with God today. Uh, frankly, I don't like to prepare a serious sermon. I, I like to prepare something that's more encouragement, upbeat, positive, Joel Olstein type tradition. But I, I have to preach what the Word of God says, and the Word of God here is pretty uh, sober. Uh, an office manager had a team of people that were consistently showing up late. So that morning he gathered the team together, and I, I says, I want to give an award for the best excuse for showing up late this morning. The winning excuse was, a werewolf tossed me against a giant packing crate while I was trying to rescue a frightened young girl who had been kidnapped. <laughs> Good excuse, but of course not a truthful one. Don't wait for the perfect Bible study. Don't wait for the perfect opportunity to witness. Don't wait to come to a perfect worship service or a perfect sermon, because that waiting 
will rob you of God's will and possibly rob you of eternity. What Christ is about to do here is to tell us, although life is so daily, daily made up of our possessions, daily made up of our employment, daily made up of our relationship, both family and friends, we better put doing God's business first in our priority list. We have a limited time. Delay in this case is deadly. Delayed obedience is often disobedience, and not to decide is to decide not to. Contrast that with Psalm 119, verse 60. I hastened and did not delay to keep thy commandments. I hurried and I focused upon keeping God's commandments. Testing the water is not acceptable. We need to do God's will. You never know when the last moment of your life may occur. I think about going out there on 172nd Avenue after the service. We're not guaranteed we'll make it. Some of those drivers on 172 think it's a freeway. Come to Christ. Do his will now. It's not a dress rehearsal. I think it's important to note here that this eternal banquet is not sitting around on a bunch of clouds strumming harps. Now, I'm not against music in eternity, obviously, and many a ministry music has told me there will be music in heaven and not preaching, so that is a humbling fact. <laughs> but in Isaiah 55, verse 2, God invites his people to his table to eat what is good and delight your soul in abundance. And so heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. It's an amazing place. But the requirements to get there are both difficult and easy. Difficult in the sense that if you look at the standards of Jesus Christ in the parables in the book of Luke, which is basically what we're doing, you look at yourself and you find yourself found wanting, lacking. But the good news is the grace of God, the purpose of the parables was not to make people feel better, not to make them feel more righteous, but to unmask the fact that they are self-centered, that their possessions do matter to them, that their employment does matter to them, and that their family and friends do matter to them, which is all okay, but do they matter more than God when God asks us to set aside for a moment one of those normal priorities and seek his face and seek his will? Now, the customs here were to send out a save the date, and then eventually when the big party was ready, send out a servant to invite all those who had been given the date. Blessed is the one who shall eat the bread in the kingdom of God. I bet the guy that said that is a very nice religious person. As a matter of fact, I think he said it to sort of diffuse the, atten the attention that was in the room. What is Jesus saying here that we who are here are hypocrites because we've only invited our family and friends and we should have been inviting needy people as opposed to people like us. So at first point in your outline there, God is extending the invitation to you right now. And the second point in your outline, you'll make excuses when you're self-preoccupied. You know, Christ spoke these words almost 2,000 years ago, and they're still so relevant today. The first excuse, property acquisition. This is uh, verse 18. And they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of land. I need to go out and look at it. Please uh, consider me excused. That's, you know, that, that's the only time the real estate agent can make it, so I can't do your will. I've got to get out there and meet the realtor. God will not accept a clear invitation to do his will. He will not accept an excuse like I got property. Weak excuses. Don't build your eternity around weak excuses. There's no excuse for failing to follow Jesus. You know, excuses are like 
armpits. Everyone has a couple and they all stink. <laughs> and if we make excuses to God, I guarantee you they're in the stinky category. So the first category is property. Is it wrong to have property? No. Is it wrong to put property above the will of God? Yes. The second one is employment responsibilities in verse 19. Another one said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Well, these parties were typically at night, so he's going to go plow at night. You know, it's, it's a real superficial excuse, but it's the I have to make a living excuse. There are many people that need to reconsider their job or at least the place they serve in their company if it means you have to be so committed to the company, you have no time for God and, in essence, no time for family. No time to be bothered with spiritual obligations is uh, definitely a trap that people of, of conscientious nature have. I, uh, it's nice to be employed. It's nice to go to work. In other words, that's a good thing for most people. But it can be the wrong priority. I remember a member, another church, who I'll leave unnamed. He moved to a more prestigious neighborhood. Well, that more prestigious neighborhood was farther away from the church and farther away from his office. And he came to church one Sunday. And I said, I haven't seen you for several Sundays. He said, well, that's really a long drive from my new home back to church. And I said, well, then maybe you should find a church there in that area. And he says, well, I, traded, I tried a couple, but they were not up to snuff. And so I'm back here, although it will only be occasionally. To which I said something cruel. <laughs> I said, isn't it farther to your work than it is to church, and you're commuting in five days a week to work, and you can't commute into church when there's hardly any traffic? He said, well, yeah, pastor, that's true, but that's business. Business was the priority. And it's when we begin to prioritize things above the will of God that we are undermining our relationship with God. Life is so daily. Life is so daily for very nice religious people. You have uh, property considerations. You have employment considerations. You have family considerations. And, and, and these kind of people are caught up with what I call the normalities of life. The normalities of life are materialistic uh, safety, uh, comfort, the pleasantries, but these things can very quickly undermine our relationship with God. How much insurance do we need? How much retirement do we need? How much work do we need to do? How many family obligations do we need to keep? If they cause us to miss God, they are disastrous. And it's the devil's most common line, and I mentioned this in a message earlier, when it comes to God's will, the devil whispers, there is no hurry. The devil whispers, not now. The devil, the devil whispers, it can wait. Sometimes we're so hypocritical when it comes to doing God's will, we miss the obvious. Two guys go out fishing on a Sunday morning. Of course, no one here would do that, all you very nice people. But anyway, they're out fishing. But the one guy comes under conviction. He says, you know, we're skipping church this morning, and we really shouldn't be here fishing. We should be at church. The other guy says, well, if we weren't here, I couldn't be at church anyway. And he says, well, why is that? Because my wife is sick at home. <laughs> her, her illness didn't prevent fishing, but it would, have, would prohibit worshiping. What are your priorities center around? What you own, where you work, your family, or are you pursuing God as first priority? These things are important. Christ said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And these things, possessions, work, family, will fall into place. There was this uh, article in a church bulletin that I got a lot of fun out called, Pastor Gives Up Citizenship in the United States. And the article reads something like this. 
I give up, I quit America. You may be wondering why I quit. Well, first of all, Washington, D.C. and the IRS, they are not friendly places. Secondly, I went to a political rally, a rally but the, the candidate didn't greet me. Thirdly, the government made a decision which I could not agree with. Fourthly, some political party rallies went into overtime and I was late getting home. Fifthly, the get out the vote rally played music I didn't know and didn't like. Sixthly, the election day was scheduled when I had other things to do and on and on and on, resigning his citizenship because the government didn't fit his needs. Are you here this morning just for you? Are you watching online just for you? Are you here to encourage other people? In other words, maybe what you get out of the service today is not as important as what you can give. Giving a word of encouragement, inviting someone to an activity that would be valuable for their spiritual growth, making an effort to contribute to this church's future in such a way that we'll get the best pastor next possible. And my sermon is not on stewardship this morning, but I noticed giving last week was pretty weak. And so I won't send that bulletin to any prospective pastor. <laughs> I want to send him a bulletin where the giving is good. And one of the things that helps a prospective pastor think positively about the church is the church is in good financial health. Well, Laurelwood is in pretty good financial health, but we want to be in stellar financial health, so when the potential pastor next looks at the books, he sees that we've uh, covered our bases when it comes to the financial responsibilities. Sometimes we get caught in our excuses, where teenagers showed up late for school that morning, and the math teacher said, well, that's okay, just stay after class this morning and I'll give you a one-question makeup quiz. Their excuse was, we had a flat tire. And of course, we had to fix the flat, had to go to a gas station, get the, fix the tire kit, you know, just took all morning to change that tire. The one-question quiz that the math teacher gave the four teenagers was, and they put them in four separate parts of the classroom, which tire was flat? <laughs> it's so easy to cling to the temporary benefits of this life rather than pursuing the cost of discipleship that Bonhoeffer talks about in his book. I, I, when, I, when Gwen and I toured Niagara Falls, the docent who uh, described all the things related to Niagara Falls, told the story that they, and you know, after the spring comes, the, the river ice begins to break up, and he had observed a massive eagle dropping down onto a small iceberg where there was the carcass of a deer, and the eagle began to feast the mighty American symbol of strength. But the eagle, as he was standing there on the iceberg, did not notice that his talons were freezing into the iceberg. And so when the iceberg came to the Niagara Falls, he lifted his wings to try and release himself from the iceberg to no avail because his talons had frozen tight with that iceberg. Many of us this morning say, oh, I, I could give up that possession, no problem. Oh, I could change my employment or reduce my hours at work, no problem. Or, or I could uh, spend less time with my family, no problem. Isn't that a unbiblical sentence, spend less time with my family? Most of us, I agree, need to spend more. but. It still can be used as an excuse. And as we excuse ourselves by very nice people responsibilities, we end up holding on to things and they will take us to our certain death. Remember, God is the one extending the invitation here. 
Pastor Dennis is not extending the invitation. And your excuses will make you self-preoccupied rather than God-focused. Then thirdly here in your outline, this is sobering, God will not accept your best excuse. The slave came back and reported to his master, this is verses 21 to 24, to the master, the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you have commanded has been done, and there is still room. And the master said to the slave, Go out to the highways and along the hedges. Compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. In other words, God is seeking us. He's after us. But here comes the sobering sentence, For I tell you, none. For I tell you, none. For I tell you, none of those men who were first invited with those excuses of property, employment, and family shall taste of my dinner. Those are sobering words. Because we have used all those excuses for not doing God's will. Do we have property responsibilities? I hope that all of you have a living trust Do we have employment responsibilities? I hope you are a stellar employee. Do we have family responsibilities where we invest in our family in such a way that they are more likely to find God's will than if you ignore them? Those are all very good things and very important things and very nice things. But if you're not seeking God's will above those things, it could be that you're missing God's will for eternity. The kingdom of God is not a bunch of very nice people who are only involved in self-serving reciprocal ministry to each other. That's just, that, that can be just pride. And the one thing about being in the needy group, if you're in a very needy group, you're poor, you're homeless, then the, the pride factor has been stripped away. Not that I haven't met some very proud homeless people, I have, but the majority are in a very humble position. And I was wondering if um, maybe on Judgment Day that some of that massive homeless population across the river, that a higher percentage of them will be in heaven than some of the people in Fisher's Landing who have got it made. When you've got it made, you're filled with pride. When you got nothing, then you're more humble. The weak, it turns out, are the heroes in this story. In Revelation 19, verse 9, the angel said, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Are you invited? Well, you have to contrast that with Psalm 7, verse 11, which says, God is angry with the wicked every day. When we don't seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God is angry at us. But there is a solution. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but by his grace and his mercy he has saved us. But you have to be humble enough to accept that. You have to be humble enough to say, God, I have put my possessions above you. God, I have put my employment above you. God, I have put my family above you. I want to seek you from this day forward. I want you to all bow your heads right now. I want you, everyone in the auditorium to bow your heads. If you really mean business with God this morning, and you can do this who are watching online as well, If you really mean business with God and you realize that your pursuit of possessions, employment, and family has preempted God's priority for your life, would you stand for a couple of seconds and recommit your life to God? Now, I realize that this doesn't solve all your spiritual issues, but at least you'll take a step. At least you've done something. At least you've moved closer to God's will. Just stand up a couple of seconds and sit down.
These are serious moments. Are you going to be content to be a very nice religious person? Or do you want to commit yourself to pursuing the grace and mercy of God because none are righteous? No, not one. But by the grace of God, you can be forgiven and begin your journey with Jesus Christ. Thank you for those who are watching online, about 12 people stood in the auditorium, and I hope you stood in your home as you're watching this. You're on God's invitation list. Your weakest decision to make a fresh commitment to Christ this morning is better than the best indecision that you've made. Look at me this morning as we have the what, the so what, and the now what in your outline. The what here, in your exit plan from earth to settle up with God, there are no excuses for failing to accept God's invitation now. So what? The kingdom of God, heaven, is not made up of a very, bunch of very nice people who are only involved in self-reciprocal ministry to each other. What are your priorities sitting around? What you own, what you do, what you nest? Are you pursuing God? If you're uncertain that by Christ's grace you have a proper standing with God, I want to invite you when you go home today, look at a site on the web called heavenornot.net. Heavenornot.net. Follow through what the scripture says there. It's not what Dennis says, it's not what pastor anybody says, it's what says the Word of God. And the Word of God is clearly laid out there in heavenornot.net in which you can find out whether or not you have a personal relationship with God. On Judgment Day, there can be no excuses, no explanations, and hopefully for you, no regrets. Let's pray.